Okay, I think we're, we're going to get started now. So welcome everyone. I'm really thrilled to have you here. I'm Courtney Worrell. I'm the president and CEO of the Waterfront Alliance. We're so pleased to have you. This is the first in a series of smaller webinars that we are holding this year on topics in climate, open space, waterfronts, and education. And we look forward to seeing you at many more. I'm so happy to have with us today Mark Rupp, who is the new Adaptation Program Manager at Georgetown University's Climate Center, formerly Mark was with the Environmental Defense Fund, where he served as the Director of State Federal Policy and Affairs. We're also joined today by Tyler Taba, Waterfront Alliance's Senior Manager for Climate Policy. Tyler manages Waterfront Alliance's climate programs and leads the Rise to Resilience Coalition. So we look forward to you getting to know Tyler in the coming years, and we're really thrilled to have him join the Waterfront Alliance as one of the newest members of our team. So a bit about us. First, our mission, the Waterfront Alliance's mission is to inspire, effect, and inspire and affect resilient, revitalized, and accessible coastlines for all communities. We do this through education and outreach, getting people on the water, and working to influence policy, laws, and regulations. One of the major focuses of the Waterfront Alliance is responding to the climate crisis. Next slide. So we, we do this through the Rise to Resilience Coalition. It's one of our methods. The coalition has been ahead of the curve when it comes to climate resilience and adaptation advocacy. We are the convener of many diverse organizations across New York and New Jersey. We are a consensus builder. The coalition uh, focuses on impactful and actionable vehicles that lead to victories through legislation and policy change. And we elevate and focus on the most vulnerable communities. So the goal is that we will be able to prepare our, our, our region, people, and infrastructure and natural ecosystems for the challenges of climate change. Next slide. So now I'll speak a little bit about the IPCC report to give it some context. Then you'll hear from Mark and uh, then you'll hear from Tyler. So um, also a note about questions, please feel free to just speak up at the end of the presentation and, um, or if you would rather, you can put your questions in the chat box. And if something's incredibly confusing, please don't, don't hesitate to interrupt. The IPCC report that came out is, just came out in February, is part two of six reports. The reports assess scientific, technical, and socioeconomic information concerning climate change. There are three working groups. And this report that just came out is the working group number two report on impacts at adaptation and vulnerability. And there are three working groups that are working on this report. The first report came out in 1990. So this is the sixth report since 1990. So the IPCC report is a blueprint for the planet. It's the how-to for a good future a future that is sustainable and allows countries to adapt to climate change and a future that is decarbonized. Press and media coverage of the report mostly focused on the closing window for ending the burning of fossil fuels. And there was an emphasis sadly on the inaccurate message that we are too late. Yes, we are too late to change the effects on some ecosystems and some parts of the world, but many elements of the report should inspire us to more strongly take the right path towards a new future and clarify the things like uh, organ the, clarify the things organizations like the Waterfront Alliance are doing that heed the call to action. So it was frustrating to see, for me, the media's reaction to the report. The day came out, NPR's marketplace mentioned it briefly with a tongue-in-cheek message to the effect of, climate change, we're just too late. <laughs> this was in a way echoed by the headline in the New York Times, climate change is harming the planet faster than we can adapt. And at the press event for the report, the first question was given to the Associated Press reporter who asked, can you address the sense of gloom and foreboding in the future painted here? And how less livable a world do you see if major emissions cuts and adaptation, adaptations are not made? We could jump into an entire presentation analyzing climate reporting, but we are not going to do that. Instead, a few reflections. First, amplification of a sense of doom and foreboding can breed the feeling that it is just too late to do anything. This is, in my opinion, a dangerous communications path that I fear could reduce our willingness to commit to the full-scale change that the IPCC report calls for. 
Admitting we have a problem is necessary to solving any problem, and that's a great thing. And the press has for a long time been trying to get the word out about the enorm enormity of this crisis. Yet even touching on statements that sound like we have a problem that is no longer solvable, that climate change is a runaway train without hope of stopping, is not responsible. Let's wait oh, maybe 2040 or 2050 for those headlines, if ever. The right messages about the report were out there. In fact, the New York Times headline was followed by the article's first sentence, which at the end said something to the effect that we will have a lot of problems unless greenhouse gas emissions are reduced, are quickly reduced. So the headline got it wrong, but the first sentence got it right by stating clearly that we are not too late, but if we wait too much longer, it could be too late. And the question from the AP reporter about foreboding and gloom at least offered IPCC co-chair Dr. Deborah Roberts the opportunity to respond saying she would like to rephrase the question, that the report is a reality check and not an autopsy. The report shows that we can be agents of change, creating a new and more sustainable world, protecting nature and changing the places where the majority of people live, which is our cities. The report lays out many integrated holistic paths for change. And that's the message that I'd like to get out that I do not think the media covered to any degree. And for this reason, I think the report is a profound and I would say hopeful recipe for the future. We might even allow ourselves to become excited about the paths we can take a comfort in and find peace in the commitment to strong action with the IPCC report as a guide. But this can only happen if we take its content seriously, act on its recommendations, and relentlessly pursue whole-scale change without delay. A few highlights about the report. The report says, first and foremost, we must stop burning coal and fossil fuels by 2050 and greatly reduce emissions by 2030. The other major message is that adaptation to climate change works and the elimination of greenhouse gases and the investment in climate change adaptation, both of those must be pursued equally vigorously. To quote Secretary, Secretary General Guterres, delay in pursuing both emissions elimination and climate change adaptation means death. It's important to point out that this report clearly states it's in, that it's important for all of us to work with government to fund to find the funding and fund the protection that's needed for cities, people, and ecosystems. It also highlights what we've known here at the Waterfront Alliance for a very long time, that climate decarbonization and preparing ourselves for climate change are not funded equally. In fact, of total global, of, of total global climate-related public sector finance, only 7% is invested in adaptation. Funding for adaptation continues to fall far behind funding for climate change mitigation. This has to come to an end. Funding for both must increase and both must be equally funded. Next slide. So lastly, I want to point out some of the major connections in the report to what the Waterfront Alliance's approach is to systems change. The, the report highlights commitments that we in fact make every day in our work. There's an emphasis on political commitment and follow through across all levels of government. That adaptation is likely to be successful where laws and policies require action from lower levels of government while providing guidelines to local governments on how to do this. Institutional frameworks are necessary to spell out clear goals, priorities, and defined responsibilities. Education and knowledge about climate risks will lead to better outcomes and informed public will lead to better commitments from, from the political sector. And NGOs must have a hand in decision-making and local knowledge is critical to all decision-making. And that's what we call bottom-up decision-making. So um, funding, as I mentioned before, is a critical part of the equation. And in fact, what the report needs for our region, which is the title of this presentation, is really that we need funding to prepare ourselves. So now I'm going to turn it over to Mark Rupp, and Mark's going to talk about the infrastructure bill and some of the aspects of funding. So get away, Mark. There. Um, thank you so much, Courtney, uh, and thank you for the invitation to be with you. Um, I've had the privilege to work with the Waterfront Alliance and Rise to Resilience um, in my previous role at the Environmental Defense Fund, and I have 
such tremendous respect for all of the work that you do. Uh, and I sincerely apologize that we stole Kate Boycourt from you, um, but it's great that there's still this ongoing partnership between you all and the Environmental Defense Fund and so many others. Um, so my plan today is to go um, just give you a general overview. Um, Courtney did a really nice job about the sixth assessment report. I'm gonna delve a little bit more into it um, and, and talk about how adaptation in the assessment reports over the years um, have been portrayed. I'm also gonna go through several of the findings um, in the report just to give you a sense as to how the report talks about vulnerabilities and risks uh, and what can be done to reduce them. Uh, but first, one thing that the report does um, from at the beginning, which I really liked and wanted to share, is provide survey data about the public's perception about uh, climate change. And since assessment report five, which came out in 2014, a growing number of people around the world do perceive that the climate is changing uh, and that they consider climate action as a matter of high urgency. The survey representing over half the world's population found that almost two thirds of people from across 50 countries view climate change as an emergency compared to just over half of those across 23 countries in 2013. The highest level of support for climate action is probably uh, won't come as a surprise to anyone, but that comes from small island developing states, uh, followed by high income countries, uh, next middle income countries, and then the least developed countries. I mentioned the survey because if there's one thing that the report really helps to do, and, and Courtney underscored, uh, is it serves as another inflection point and a rallying cry for action on climate on both mitigation and adaptation which the report, as Courtney mentioned, ties together throughout. And the more that people are seeing climate change as a matter of high urgency that demands interventions, then ostensibly the more government officials and others are more likely to do what needs to be done to create a more resilient and just world. Um, I wanted to provide just some numbers related to the sixth assessment report. Um, the, the planning for the report actually came in May of 2017 uh, with the draft outline sort of demonstrates how long this process takes um, up till being released on February 28th. Um, big numbers, um, and uh, remember that this is just one of three reports, as Courtney mentioned, and then the fourth report will be a synthesis. Um, but this report includes nearly 3,700 pages, has 270 authors with 675 contributing authors, um, there have been more than 60,000 combined comments on the first and second drafts, as well as the final draft. And there are over 34,000 citations to scientific papers. And it was approved by the 195 members of the IPCC. There are numerous chapters um, in this report, um, 18 of them, um, plus several cross chapter papers that look at things like cities and settlements by the sea, uh, polar caps, tropical forests, and more. Um, the chapters probably don't surprise you. Um, the sort of first chapter launches us into um, key concepts around risk and vulnerability and adaptation. Uh, several chapters dealing with different ecosystems, terrestrial and freshwater, ocean and coastal. Uh, there's a chapter on water, on food, cities, health. Uh, and then there are several chapters, each individually dealing with different regions of the world. Uh, there's a chapter on Africa, on Europe, North America, and the like. Um, the IPC assessment of adaptation has certainly evolved through time. Um, assessment report number four, which came out in 2007, included just one chapter dedicated to adaptation. Uh, the report uh, number five um, expanded the number of chapters to four. Uh, and then with this last report, as I mentioned, includes only 18 within those cross chapter discussions as well. So it really mainstreams adaptation comprehensively throughout the whole of the report. Um, and in addition, um, and as Courtney mentioned as well, uh, the development of this report was supported by the two other working groups, uh, one that de deals with the physical science of climate change uh, and the other focused on mitigation. Uh, there are other ways that reporting on adaptation has improved over the years. Um, this latest report really puts an emphasis on equity and climate justice. 
and expands attention to how it is that inequities um, are captured in climate vulnerabilities and responses to vulnerabilities, uh, captures the role of power and participation in processes to implement adaptation strategies, and also talks about the unequal and differential impacts to addressing adaptation. There's also a greater attention to in the incorporation of indigenous knowledge, and Courtney also mentioned the local knowledge. And appropriately, the report acknowledges and recognizes that indigenous peoples have been faced with adaptation challenges for centuries and have developed strategies for resilience in changing environments that can enhance and improve our current and future adaptation efforts. This latest report also, um, more than the earlier reports, puts a spotlight on governance systems as being key to the success or failure of climate change adaptation. And, and not just governance within governmental systems, but including the many partners that are necessary in robust governance structures to help plan and implement, monitor and evaluate adaptation action. And these partners include the likes of the Waterfront Alliance, businesses, academics, and so many more. Um, the report also speaks to the importance of governance across multiple levels of jurisdictions and decision making. So think globally, regionally, nationally, and of course, locally. While our knowledge of adaptation has significantly expanded since 2014, the report and the available evidence suggest significant adaptation gaps still exist. Many current adaptation efforts constitute adaptation planning rather than implementation, and most current implementation efforts represent incremental stages as opposed to really transformational adaptation. And that's not surprising to any of us because implementation is always difficult, particularly if the resources don't exist, which has and continues to be a significant gap. The report really is a wake up call because the time scales involved with so many adaptation actions and the potential to significantly reduce longer term costs with near term actions tend to be long. So over the next few years, we really must act at a scale and speed far faster than our current trends afford us. And that's because climate change impacts and risks are becoming increasingly complex and more difficult to manage. Multiple climate hazards are occurring simultaneously and multiple climactic and non-climactic risks are interacting, resulting in compounding overall risk and risks cascading across sectors and regions. We continue to see these examples in the United States. For example, long periods of drought uh, that adversely affect food systems and hasten wildfires in the West. And then we have contemporaneous wind and flooding events across the Midwest. In the United States, um, NOAA has, has some great charts that demonstrate this, but we've had significantly more single billion dollar disaster events that occur annually in the United States um, in an unprecedented way. Uh, the most disaster events that are each a billion dollar cost or more uh, have happened in the last decade. And notably, we've had increasing incidents in 2016, 2017, 2019, 2020, and 2021. The good news is that the assessment reflects the adaptation strategies that are being planned, that they are being developed, and they are being implemented to a greater degree. There are many pilot projects and local experiments that are ongoing and exploring various types of adaptation that provide a real basis for ongoing improvement and scaling up. But again, the bad news is that the current scale of adaptation isn't sufficient to meet the challenge of climate change. And in some cases is leading to unintended outcomes if it's not well coordinated, monitored, and is at risk of rapidly losing its effectiveness because of shifts driven by climate change itself. I want to give a few examples of some of the report entries, just um, for those who haven't read through the 3,700 pages, uh, to give you a sense as to how findings are, are represented. Um, in the report for identified risks and vulnerabilities and impacts, the confidence in, in their occurrence is expressed qualitatively um, in terms of medium confidence or very high confidence to describe the robustness of any particular finding based on, and, and quoting the report, the type, the amount, the quality and consistency of evidence, and on the degree of agreement across multiple lines of evidence, end quote. So for example, the report finds that there is a high confidence that human and ecosystem vulnerability are in interdependent 
which wouldn't surprise any of you, though uh, if you may think like I do, I would claim that there is a very high confidence about that interdependency. Um, but let me go through some of, of the findings. Uh, with respect to observed and projected impacts and risks, um, human-induced climate change, including more frequent and intense extreme events, has caused widespread adverse impacts and related losses and damages to nature and people. Across sectors and regions, the most vulnerable people and systems are observed to be disproportionately affected. The rise in weather and climate extremes has led to some irreversible impacts as natural and human systems are pushed beyond their ability to adapt. And there is high confidence in that. Uh, with respect to food systems, and this is specific to North America, climate-induced redistribution and declines in North American food production are a risk to food and nutritional security, a very high confidence. Climate change will continue to shift North American agriculture and fishery suitability ranges, high confidence of that, and intensify production losses of key crops, again, a high confidence, to livestock, a medium confidence, to fisheries, a high confidence, and to aquaculture products, uh, and there is a medium confidence. Uh, with respect to water, intensified droughts and early runoff from diminished snowpack will increase water scarcity during the summer peak water demand period, especially in regions with extensive irrigated agriculture, leading to economic losses and increased pressures on limited groundwater as a substitute for diminished surface water supplies. And there's a medium to high confidence there. Um, as I, I, I do want to get into um, talking about the resource issue and sort of the, the positive um, opportunity that we have um, here in the United States. Just a couple more of these entries. With respect to current adaptation and its benefits, there are feasible and effective adaptation options which can reduce risks to people and nature. The feasibility of implementing adaptation options in the near term differs across sectors and regions very high confidence. The effectiveness of adaptation to reduce climate risk is documented for specific contexts, sectors, and regions, there's a high confidence, and will decrease with increasing warming, a high confidence. Integrated multi-sectoral solutions that address social inequities, differentiate responses based on climate risk, and cut across systems increase the feasibility and effectiveness of adaptation in multiple sectors. And this is really getting at um, the, the comment earlier about how all of these disasters are, are happening simultaneously. And so the more that we're looking at responses in, in sort of holistic ways, the better off as a nation and a world we're going to be. Um, they're enabling conditions um, and they're key for implementing and accelerating and sustaining adaptation in human systems and ecosystems. Uh, those include political commitment and follow through, institutional frameworks, policies, and instruments with clear goals and priorities, enhanced knowledge on impacts and solution, how it is that we mobilize and, and access adequate financial resources, and again, monitor and evaluate uh, and have inclusive governance. Um, in the interest of time, I'm, I'm going to work to close off my time here with you. Um, but um, there, there, there is another challenge that, that is, presents itself. Um, in the chapter that deals with North America, um, one, of, um, one of the challenges that's identified, uh, and, and this is notwithstanding uh, sort of the global belief that climate change is happening in our world, um, the identified barrier to acting on climate is the misinformation and politicization of climate change science that has created polarization in public and policy domains. And there's a high confidence of that. And, and we've clearly seen that um, over the course of the last four years and ongoing. Uh, it goes on to read that the resultant public and misinformation of climate risks and polarized public support for climate actions is delaying urgent adaptation planning and implementation. And there's a high confidence of that. Um, but one of the things, and um, um, you know, what gives me so much hope, and when we're thinking about the need for resources, um, I'm going to um, be self-serving, and, and when I finish, I'll put a link to an article that I just had published in American City and County. Um, but two things, um, you know, we do have to deal with climate 
greenhouse gas mitigation as we do with adaptation. I do think in the United States that it's the mitigation side that tends to be the most polarizing and largely because of entrenched interests in, in coal and oil. Um, but I, I have found over the years that there is truly bipartisan support in this country uh, to act on adaptation and resilience. Uh, we see that at the, at the federal level where you can go through and see any number of bill, bills that deal with adaptation and resilience that are bipartisan. You can go to the state level and, and I will candidly say that I do not agree with most of Governor DeSantis of Florida's approaches to policies. Um, but the one thing that he deserves credit for is really investing in climate resilience. When he first came into office, he appointed a chief climate scientist and he appointed a chief resilience officer to plan resilience activities. Uh, and he has invested a lot of state resources into dealing with sea level rise. Um, but at the federal level, and, and the, the point that I'll end on uh, is the bipartisan infrastructure law that Congress passed and President Biden signed last November. Um, one of the things that's exciting to me is the notion that it is an infrastructure bill. And in, in light of that, if we're going to be investing in any infrastructure in this country, it needs to be resilient. So it's, it's interesting to me that, that the administration actually only sort of touts $47 billion of resilience in a $1.2 trillion package. Uh, and they appropriately point to things like resources for dealing with drought in the West, a uh, billion dollars in resources for FEMA and the Building Resilient Infrastructure and Communities Program, um, things of that nature. But again, if we're investing in infrastructure, that infrastructure has got to be resilient. Uh, and the IPCC report underscores that um, time and again. Um, a couple things um, that are really important to ensure that that $1.2 trillion is actually effectively utilized. Obviously, how it is that governance structures are, are established, and, and we saw that in the IPCC report. A lot of governors are appointing infrastructure directors. Um, one particular approach that I really appreciate, and I mentioned in this article, is Governor Hutchinson of Arkansas, who issued an executive order to really make the infrastructure package and, and how the resources are going to flow into the state um, a real whole of government approach. Um, because when you think about the needs of communities, you know, you've got resources flowing through a half dozen different agencies at the federal level. And then those are then in turn flowing into state agencies. But how can you actually weave those programmatic dollars together in ways that will actually serve communities and in particular disadvantaged communities. So I think Governor Hutchison is setting up a, a good state process, but it really demands that he's engaging with um, minority leaders and with counties and city officials. Uh, and then as we talked about earlier, just the notion of all the partners that are needed to have a really robust governance structure. So that's all going to be really important, but I, um, I will close um, and, and welcome a conversation with all of you, but I do have really high confidence that there's a lot of bad in the report, but I'm, I'm with Courtney here. I do think that, um, you know, if we as a nation and a world can slow the warming of the, of the globe, um, then we're going to be able to build on a lot of the plans that, that folks through the Water Alliance and others have been laying out, um, we will resource them and, and we'll be able to do a lot to protect humans uh, and the environment. So I will stop there, Courtney, and turn it over to Taylor um, and look forward yeah. to the conversation. Thank you, Mark. Yeah, thanks, that was great. Yeah, Tyler is going to take it away and, um, and talk a bit about the Waterfront Alliance's work and how it relates to much of what you just talked about. So go ahead, Tyler. Sure, <clears throat> I'll wait for the slides to come up. Okay, perfect. Um, yeah, so thank you, Courtney, and thank you, Mark, for setting the stage so beautifully. Um, you know, Courtney, at the beginning of the presentation, did mention the Rise Resilience Coalition, and this coalition and campaign really is our response to the climate crisis. Um, it's a coalition of over 100 organizations across New York and New Jersey with the goal of making our region more resilient to climate change, especially those who are most vulnerable through new policies, reforms, and investments in resilient infrastructure, land use, housing, and natural resources. On this slide, um, the next slide, you can see a little bit of the behind the scenes um, of our 
action and vision for the coalition. Our work usually falls under these four categories of policy, access, leadership, and visibility. And here we're talking about um, policy and legislative victories, um, increasing influence and access to elected officials and leaders in the private sector, cultivating a real sense, a strong sense of ownership and leadership, and growing the coalition's visibility to increase engagement and awareness of our work. So shifting gears a little bit, I'd like to kind of break down our bi-state uh, climate resiliency policy agenda. So you can see a list of some of the current items, some of our current advocacy items here. And what's important to note, I think, is that our work really intersects with the IPCC and leading scientists and what they're calling for. In our rise resilience work, uh, we focus a lot on stronger investments in planning, on nature-based solutions, adequate levels of funding to achieve resilience, comprehensive resilience, and that's just to name a few things. And in the next few slides, I'm going to go through in a little bit more detail some of these advocacy priorities. So I'll start with flood disclosure. Uh, we launched this initiative and have positioned ourselves really as a leading organization in this effort. And just for some context, flood disclosure would require uh, sellers to inform potential buyers and renters um, about any flood damages to the property that they're aware of. In states like New York and New Jersey, where flood risks are really high, this kind of disclosure is a step toward transparency and awareness about flood risk. So buying a home is, uh, you know, one of the most important decisions that somebody makes in their lives. And so having all the available information to make an informed uh, decision and purchase is really what this is getting at. The legislation is also a little bit about changing behavior with an eye toward purchasing flood insurance and potentially making retrofits to your home to be more resilient to flood impacts. And there's also some level of precedent for this kind of disclosure. You can think of lead-based paint disclosure. So our approach is pretty similar to what you would think of when you think of a lead-based paint disclosure. And uh, moving to funding. So uh, we're always fighting for good budgets for climate resilience uh, through the coalition. And I had the opportunity last week to testify in front of the New York City Council for a climate resilient city budget. And some of the highlights of that testimony were just that we really have an opportunity to address our vulnerabilities through meaningful and concentrated action, but that that action has to start with a climate resilient budget that lays the foundation for long-term investments in community engagement, green infrastructure, um, green infrastructure upgrades, and just overall climate adaptation. The preliminary budget that was put forth um, really urges fiscal responsibility for New York City, but um, in our opinion, uh, without proper investments in climate resilience and adaptation, then we're going to be spending billions of dollars in recovery efforts following storms that, frankly, we're just unprepared for right now. So the overall message is really that it's fiscally responsible to invest in protections up front by funding, you know, neighborhood planning and a few of these things that you see on the slide that I'm actually going to get to here in a minute. So moving to planning, um, this is a major advocacy priority for rise to resilience. The Five Borough Climate Adaptation Plan, which is also known as ADAPT NYC, is a new plan for climate adaptation in New York City. And the city will be evaluating the impacts of climate change and actually working with communities at a really hyper-local level to help develop projects in their communities. And on the slide, you can see a few of the goals that include, you know, neighborhood planning, climate justice, government accountability, but our focus really is on the neighborhood planning um, of all of this. So on the next slide, you'll see that uh, Rise Resilience will really be calling for the city to uphold its commitments to working with communities, especially those who are most climate vulnerable. It's really important because planning is what ultimately leads to shovel-ready projects. And so working with the community to kind of understand the risks, the city can be better prepared to deploy projects um, once funding and resources become available. This plan really I think has the potential to be the backbone for resiliency in New York City if it's properly funded and sustained. So that could finally give us something like a comprehensive resilience strategy across the city rather than these kind of ad hoc projects that we're seeing come and go in different neighborhoods. I'd also like to talk about one other planning initiative and that's the New Jersey Municipal Land Use Law. Uh, this was passed two years ago and it's a plan that requires um, towns across New Jersey to assess their impacts associated to climate change uh, when they update their land use plans. So what's really important to note here is the bottom up planning initiative. So communities are really starting the process as opposed to the state coming in from the top down, which allows for community members to share their experiences and their ideas that can then be kind of integrated and implemented into the plans. We know that climate data and projections are obviously really important, but equally are the desires of the community. So strong planning really marries these two things together. And just to wrap up, I really want to summarize uh, what we're all about. Rise Resilience is committed to ensuring that frontline voices are engaged and empowered through our Rise Resilience uh, Coalition and our meetings. 
to providing stipends to grassroots and environmental justice organizations for their time and for their activism, expanding outreach and engagement strategies to our new partners, um, prioritizing communities that are most vulnerable to economic downturns, uh, systemic racism, and environmental and public health threats, and to just always be seeking opportunities for coalition voices to be magnified in any kind of public stakeholder process. So I'll stop there. Uh, that's the end of my presentation. So thank you all really for your time. Um, and I think I'll toss it to Courtney, but we can move on to a discussion and a Q&A portion for the rest of the time. Great. Well, thank you, Tyler. All right. So we are just about on time, which is great. We want to end at, at 9.45 unless people want to stay and, and ask um, additional questions. But let's open it up to questions. I think that we have, um, I think Emmeline Coster is on and has the opportunity to speak first. Uh, yes, uh, thank you, uh, Courtney. And good morning. I am Emmeline Coster, a geologist. Um, and a former board member of the Waterfront Alliance. And uh, maybe Courtney's not gonna be surprised by the direction of comment that I'd like to offer to this, uh, to this session. Um, I'd like, maybe it's not um, particularly with reference to this discussion, but I'd like to say uh, and, and comment that I believe there's a lens of science that is missing from these discussions and from the uh, part of your discussion that is pointing towards the actions we need to take. <clears throat> what I'm referring to is that um, the climate, um, the the uh, the word we use for changes in the atmosphere and its contained uh, weather, um, and both climate is changing as we know, and it has always changed geologically, and so has climate always had extremes, but it seems as though climate change is stimulating a greater frequency of more severe extreme weather events. And the New York area, obviously, being right at the shoreline and uh, built close to sea level and having an infrastructure that didn't anticipate the kind of flooding events which deluged the city uh, many times in the last decade. Uh, these are considerations which I know, I'm sure you all believe to be part of the climate resilience issue. But what I am appealing to is that uh, the earth operates as one giant ecosystem in which the atmosphere can't be separated from the other encircling uh, spheres and systems of the planet. And so uh, we, re we often connect climate change to sea level rise, which may or may not be an issue if the land level is also rising. But in, in uh, places like the Gulf Coast and in Sacramento, uh, and to some extent on the Atlantic coast, these are subsiding areas. And so climate change and sea level rise are very serious exacerbating developments. And that's one example of the connectivity between one shell and the other. We also know that climate change has exacerbated that part of the humanosphere, which is only really part of the biosphere, that, that part in which uh, we seven billion humans live, which we have realized time and again in the 21st and 22nd centuries, 20th and 21st centuries, that uh, the virosphere, the, that, that part of the biosphere that contains viral diseases and pandemics is also um, you know, a big part of our consideration. And climate change exacerbates and motivates viruses to do what they have done. There's loads of research on the connection between pandemics and climate change. So my bottom line is my appeal is to, to open up the lens and to recognize that climate change must be seen as an integral, inseparable part of the whole Earth system, uh, which encloses the whole planet. And that um, to only consider climate in isolation is to um, miss on essential interdependent uh, forces of nature. Well, thanks, Emlyn. I, yeah, you were right. Um, I uh, we agree completely. <laughs> so, um, and I think there's also embedded in this some some um, some discussions about mission and 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 how uh, interconnected our work is to other issues, in particular public health, which is something we're starting to talk about. So, thank you for that. It. Uh, I want to open it up if there is another question or any comments. Or any response to Ellen? Hey, Courtney, it's John Boulay. Can you hear me? Yeah. Hi, John. I want to thank uh, both Tyler and uh, Mark uh, for their presentations. I, I guess I would like to ask Mark, uh, 
Um, you know, as you said, we need to act faster and further. Uh, I took a note on that, by the way. Um, and uh, I guess what I'm asking is, in terms of the level of resource uh, needed, do you see over the last 20 years an increasing level of resources being uh, committed to adaptation? We know it's not sufficient, but is, is the level of resources that governments are putting towards adaptation, does that seem to be on the increase or did the report have anything to say about that? Um, thanks for the question. Um, so I'll focus on the United States um, and there has been an increase um, and just a handful of examples. So um, two years ago, um, Virginia came into the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative uh, which is a cap and trade program for the energy sector, which New York and New Jersey are a part of. Um, and in the, in the enacting legislation, 45%, um, I think, of auction proceeds go into a community flood fund. Um, and then 25% of those actually are earmarked for disadvantaged communities. So you have statewide investments there. Actually, just in the, in the last election, you had um, Virginia Beach residents um, by a margin of like 72% uh, voted to increase their property tax rates to raise 560 some million dollars um, for investments in dealing with sea level rise. Similarly, in a little town um, in Miami-Dade County, um, the year before um, California, um, you know, when they enacted their um, multi-sector cap and invest program, um, they do earmark resources towards adaptation and resilience. Washington State just last year um, passed its own multi-sector cap and trade program. And when that goes into effect, beginning in theoretically January of 2023, um, a significant portion of auction proceeds will go towards adaptation and resilience and particular carves out, carve outs for both um, communities of color and indigenous tribal nations in Washington state. So there has been, and, and like I said, I, I think we sort of culminated in this moment of, of getting bipartisan support around an infrastructure package that to me is really about adaptation and, and resilience. Is, is it all enough? Um, I think we'd all argue no, um, but it, there has been an increase over time. I would, <clears throat> I would also say just something that Mark, you, you you pointed out in your presentation, which is that a lot of the change has been incremental and we need, it's it, it's large scale funding that would really mean that we'd be able to invest in major changes that are that are transformational. I think that's an issue. And just to, unless there's another question, but just to follow up on, on that point and, and sort of getting into more holistic solutions, right, and to some degree coming back to Emlyn, your, your point, I mean, climate is affecting every aspect of our lives as people, uh, and so the responses can't just be incremental to one particular sector. You've got to think about it holistically, and it's one of the points of the report that this has to be transformational, um, and, you know, we just can't go bit by bit, but thinking about the system as a whole. Jennifer. <clears throat> yeah, I was just wondering, I heard a lot in this conversation about the role of government and the role of NGOs, but I haven't heard much about the role of the private sector and specifically the private sector with regard to mitigation. Um, could you talk a little, well, actually both, if, if you could talk a little bit about the role of the private sector in general, I think that would be um, very interesting. I would just say, make one point and then I'll pass it off to Mark, which is that the idea between uh, the idea about legislation and pushing government for legislation is that that can require things from the private sector. So it, government in terms of laws and, and policies and programs that the private sector can be a part of. But Mark, I'd, would you like to follow up on that? <laughs> um, imperative. I, I think that, you know, there, there are degrees of of how corporate players are, are active or not uh, in both climate mitigation and adaptation. 
I think, you know, coming from a, an environmental organization like the Environmental Defense Fund that works closely with businesses, um, there's actually, a you know, a, a large number of, of companies that the EDF partners with uh, and trying to get them to reduce greenhouse gas emissions in their own practices. Um, and, um, you know, on, on adaptation, I think you, you wind up with a lot of businesses that are in risk prone areas. And so they're trying to figure out how um, in order to maintain operations there, what they need to do um, in supporting the community in which they're based. And I think there's been some uh, good progress made there, um, but it's, it's sort of all over the place. Thank you. Okay, any last questions? Thanks, Dr. Williams. Oh, yes, I just have a question. Uh, climate resilient development. Can you speak a little to that? And the reason I'm asking that is we have a major project uh, moving in, in our community called Auburn East, which is actually going to be constructed uh, in, in an area that is very close to the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, you know, we have the Atlantic Ocean to the south of Jamaica Bay uh, to the north. But uh, some community organizations are concerned because the developer has requested uplifting the zoning uh, for that project. And I don't know if there's consideration of the resilient uh, resiliency in that development uh, uh, project. So could you speak, because I know the report speaks about it a little bit. Uh, could you just uh, elaborate a little bit on that? Um, uh, maybe, so Tyler or Karen, if, if you know anything specific about Auburn East, I, I do have a general comment about upzoning, but if, if anybody on if anybody from Water for Alliance or Mark wants to spe speak specifically to that project. Okay, oh, go ahead, Karen. Yeah, I mean, I thanks for the question, Dr. Williams. And I think there's, you know, a deeper conversation about that project. There's been some um, uh, debate between homeowners and, uh, you know, building large residential mul multifamily hundreds of units um, and whether, you know, more of a strategy for individual homeowner retrofits should be emphasized versus uh, putting so much density into the floodplain. And it, it's obviously a complicated question because affordable housing is absolutely needed in the borough and, and in the Rockaways. Um, you, you know, Waterfront Alliance looks at a lot of these resiliency adaptation questions through the Waterfront Edge design guidelines, um, as some of you know. And I think setting some of these benchmarks and standards that go beyond what is required uh, by the city or by the state uh, is a direction that you know we should be moving towards. I think there you know are bigger political questions about building in the floodplain that we can have as well. Uh, we should be having, um, but I think Dr. Williams, the the question of what what standards are the developers meeting uh, in terms of their building footprint, in terms of what they're doing with at the water's edge. Uh, and this is a unique project because it's right off the beach. So it's 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 not technically at, at the water's edge the way you would be say in like, like by the East River, or the Hudson River. But um, I, you know, I think we can definitely connect offline and talk about the waterfront edge design guidelines and what are some of the benchmarks and standards that a project like that should be should be emphasizing. Thank you, Karen. And I would just add that there is a conversation to be had about building in the floodplain in very dense urban environments and, and whether or not that's a good idea. And, um, and um, we can talk later about the, the loose position that the Waterfront Alliance has right now on that, but we have talked to NRDC and some of our partners specifically about this topic. And so um, it's, a, it's a conversation that we definitely continue to have. And I'll just say, climate resilient development, there was a big emphasis in the IPCC report on how important it is to include nature in all, in all development. And that was, a, uh, that was one of the key points of that. So Mark, were you gonna say something? Yeah, just a, another general point on climate resilient development. You know, one of the points the report makes is that nearly half of the, the world's population live in places that are 
incredibly high risk. So on coasts that are at risk of flooding, uh, in um, arid areas that will no longer be able to sustain them with agriculture, um, in high wildfire prone areas. And so we're, we're also creating climate refugees around the globe and even within the United States. Um, there's actually a, a project we're working on at the Climate Center in Louisiana, um, looking at um, communities if it, through managed retreat and then the receiving communities for them, how they sort of absorb new people. And so when you're thinking about new development and the absolute necessity that it takes into account climate resilience, um, because the other challenge is that the report's calling for, you know, preservation of 30 to 50% of the ecosystems around the globe. And so how, how can we develop in ways um, that, uh, take into account all of those considerations and, and having places where people will need to move to. Thank you. <clears throat> yeah, just wanted to add a comment of uh, perspective. The, uh, the museum, Nature and Science Museum field of which I'm a part, has arguably come late to the indigenous tradition, at least in the Iroquois and Dakota people, and it's it's emulated in the Australian Aboriginal oral tradition that we need to take a multi generation approach. The um, there is a, a colleague uh, Richard Josie Jr. who heads up a non profit consultancy called Collective Journeys, based in Virginia, who is strongly advocating uh, the incorporation of these traditions and and more broadly what uh, is talked about as the good, being a good ancestor. I'm now talking ab about that in the, in the titles of my talks internationally. The idea of being a good ancestor uh, elevates the public's consideration that they can't have a me now, but rather they must have an us future approach. And so, uh, you know, we need, I think all the time to think about refreshing jargon, refreshing terminology, and climate change is becoming tired and, and people have a gazillion definitions of it, but putting it into, into one's own mentality and one's own obligation to think, to be aware, to think responsibly and to do what one can to act responsibly, I think is nicely covered as are many people beginning to see and agree with this notion of being a good ancestor. It can affect both individuals and organizations. So I, I'd, I'd like to suggest that you consider that at the Waterfront Alliance and start to incorporate, you're talking about respect for and involvement of indigenous people, but, but this is a very valuable concept that emanates from their culture. Thank you, Emlyn. I agree. Um, all right, we have Diana, I believe, has a question. Hi. Oh, I should put... Hi. Um, could take my hand off now. Um, I just, uh, in response to the woman who talked about, asked about what we can each do um, by ourselves, I just wanted to add to this conversation and him bringing up all the different aspects that has to be a holistic response. Um, one is um, not eating animals anymore. And that's what I'm really trying to get people to become vegetarians and even vegans because of how much less water is used um, in uh, eating lower on the you know, food chain. And I just think that that could be a major, major thing that, so like in, uh, in your events, in all of the environmentalist events, um, if they could be uh, vegetarian and even vegan, I think you would be giving a, a really good um, model to what we can all do um, as just as individuals. Yeah, Diana, thanks so much for that comment. Uh, we agree. Um, and uh, one of the things that we're really excited about at the Waterfront Alliance is we have more capacity now for managing our events and we'll be looking at a, a sustainable event strategy over time. And I, I think this is an incredibly important point. Thank you. It's nice to think about in-person events. <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, that's the perfect segue for me to plug the conference we have coming up. Our conference is May 24th. And uh, I see a lot of people on this call who are playing a role one way or another or um, 
our sponsors. So thank you so much. Um, it will be, if you haven't already signed up, it promises to be a, a jam-packed day full of many, many discussions that are relevant to almost everything we've touched on and more, but also an entirely, um, an entire focus on the, the harbor and maritime industry and offshore wind as, as well. So please join us if you haven't already signed up in one way or another. So all right, I think that wraps it up unless there's one last quick comment. And uh, I just wanna thank everybody for being here and, and stay tuned. We'll do probably three more of these smaller uh, webinars this year. So um, they will cover all sorts of topics. So, so um, look in your inbox, you'll hear from us. Thank you all so much. Thank you, Mark. And thank you, Tyler. <laughs>